is the importance of religion? Before we talk about the importance of religion, perhaps it would be better to say a few words what is meant by the word religion. The reason is that people interpret religion differently. Therefore, it is better to clear this point first. Religion means the impulse rooted deep in human nature to establish one's relationship with the universe, to know why I am here, who am I, what is the cause behind the universe, and what relationship I bear to that cause. Religion also implies a sense of wonder, awe, and respect for the Creator who has brought us into being, with a longing to pray or worship Him. This tendency has been in evidence from as far back as the dawn of human culture. And even prior to that, in a very primitive form among the savages. Now, keeping in view this interpretation of religion, we have now to assess its importance. Its importance lies in the fact that all our ethical and moral values have sprung from religion. In the primitive societies, the first ideas of totem or taboo, as for instance, taboo of marrying within the family, started from the religious impulse from the idea of sacred and the profane, that which belonged to the earth, to this world, was treated as the profane, and that which was above this earth, which related to the soul, was treated as the sacred. So we find the rudiments of our moral sense stretching back to the remotest periods in history. People do not realize it, but even in those countries where they have materialistic ideologies, the fundamental principles are based on religion, fraternity, equality, love for fellow human beings. It is the religious teachers who have promulgated these doctrines. They could otherwise, in a society struggling for existence, never come into existence at all. It is the religious impulse that has been at the base of all moral and ethical progress of mankind. From this you can see what importance religion has from the ethical point of view. The other importance is that Man is unaware about himself. He does not know why far he has come, what is the purpose of his life, where he is going, and whether at the end he would survive or perish with the body. This is of absolute importance to him, for framing his social and political structures. If he is a mortal creature doomed to vanish at the end of life, his whole attitude towards the world would be different.
from what it would be if he comes to know that he is an immortal being and has to live even after his death, maybe to pay for his deeds, that would change his whole ideas about life. That is the second reason. The third reason is that man does not know himself. Through all his life he is like a sleepwalker. He does not know where from he has come, where he is going, what is his actual position in this universe. He just works day and night, sleeps, eats, drinks, has children, without ever being aware to what plane he belongs, what is his own real province and territory. He associates himself with his body, with his senses, with the world, without knowing who he is in actuality. This is the third importance of religion, because he has to know himself, just as wonder is the source of all philosophy and science. We wonder at things, how they happen, and then we enquire. As Socrates has said, that wonder is the father of all philosophy. Similarly, the religious impulse is implanted by nature to know ourselves, to know the first cause behind the universe. So, in this lies the paramount importance of religion. Did the prophets and the founders of the world's great religions actually see God? And if they didn't, what's your explanation? Here again we need a little clarification. Now, different people have different ideas about God. Some imagine God as a magnified human being. Some imagine Him as a spirit. Some imagine Him as pure consciousness. And some, like Buddha, do not believe that there is a God or an eternal cause behind the universe. I would not say he did not believe, but he never threw light on this problem. Whenever the question was put to him, he remained silent. Whenever the question was put to him whether the soul was immortal, he remained silent. Whether, whenever the question was put whether there was a God, he remained silent. So, but others, the other prophets, believed in God or Brahman or a universal state of consciousness. We have to picture it this way that there is a creative power behind the universe which we can call the divine, which has brought us all into existence, as also all the other planets and suns in space. If we assume this power to be the creator, it will meet the requirements of everyone, the Brahman of the Upanishads, the Allah of Islam, or God of Christians. That is the divine power behind the universe, the creator. Instead of naming it God, we can name it the creator. And in fact, it is the creator about which all the religious scriptures are teaching us, are giving us information. Why are there different descriptions of God given by the different prophets? Why is there such a difference in the tenets of faith among them?
in actual fact there is not much difference in the different in the descriptions given by the various prophets if we look at it from the point of view of divinity entrance into the realm where god exists that is in the domain of the spirit is not an easy matter the human mind has to yield place to another sense to another faculty before the unseen realms of the spirit can become visible to us if we go to a new territory even on the earth we are usually confused at first because we are not able to adjust what we see with the things we already know in the same way we can very well imagine that if a prophet is all of a sudden transported into the presence of a divine power it would be extremely difficult for him to put the vision in the right perspective he would have something of his old human self there to describe it so some have described it as an ocean of consciousness others as a divine being sitting on a throne others as pure spirit spread everywhere but they are unanimous in certain things that is god is glory god is spirit god is omnipotent god is omnipresent god is omniscient and god is the creator of the universe they may have drawn different pictures at different levels of their own perception and their narratives might be different but when we look at it from a very penetrating point of view we find that their description is tally in the broader uh, outlines so that there are similarities between the visions of for instance Christ and Muhammad Buddha the author of the Bhagavad Gita and the great prophets there are many similarities in the first place there is the sensation of light in every vision of divinity or god the seer or the prophet finds himself and clothed in glory the glory of the god or of the divinity which he is perceiving the other thing is of immensity of the vision he feels that he is in presence of an all pervading personality or consciousness then there is the certitude that life is immortal that i am immortal that there is a soul in me which belongs to god then again there is wonder and awe all the prophets have expressed this their wonder and awe at the sight of god or the spirit or consciousness whatever you may call it then again there is emotion the whole heart goes towards this vision there are tears in the eyes the heart throbs palpitates and one has a sense of complete and utter surrender and submission so there are many similarities in the vision 
of divinity experienced by all prophets to which they have given expression in their writings. Then there are also similarities in the revelations granted to them in that state, which we can discuss at another place. So you would say that there are basic characteristics of that God vision or the mystic experience or enlightenment. Um, is this vision for people who are especially born for the experience? You see, according to the traditional views of different faiths, those who are granted the vision are the recipients of heavenly grace. They are chosen for it. For instance, we believe that all the prophets who came were the chosen envoys of Almighty God. They were sent to mankind with His commandments or His message. This is the traditional belief. In India, the belief is that they are the incarnations of God, that God Himself incarnates in the human form and then becomes a prophet like Krishna or Rama. And according to Buddha, he was enlightened. He realized himself and then was able to give the wisdom for others to follow. So there are different versions of this experience in different faiths of mankind. But I am putting another interpretation on it. According to my own experience and also according to the study I have made of the various scriptures, it appears to me that this experience of God or cosmic consciousness is actually an experience of a higher form of consciousness towards which mankind is evolving at present. In other words, what I mean to say is that just as man climbed from the state of an animal to that of a man, rich with wisdom and knowledge and ethics which do not exist in the animal kingdom, he has to take another leap to reach a higher dimension of consciousness where he can perceive the creative energies of the universe. What would be the characteristics of a man who had this vision? What should be the characteristics of a person who is suddenly transported to Mars and is able to roam the whole universe, leaving his body on the earth? It would be a stupendous experience. It would change his whole concept of the universe. He would then be a pure spirit, moving here and there at his will, without any pain, sorrow, suffering, or need for food, drink, or sleep. This is a simile to make you understand what effect mystical experience has on a person. He sees himself now as an immortal being, as one with the divine forces in the universe. He is no longer a mortal now, afraid of small things. His vision is broadened. He is able to look into the future as also into the past. New knowledge is granted to him, and he lives 
a nobler life compared to the average individuals. He becomes humble, he becomes a devotee of divinity, he is always in a state of prayer or worship within, because he feels the imminence, the presence of divinity around him and in himself. So, this should be the criterion by which we can judge a person who has this experience, he is transformed. When the prophets and the great founders of the religions lived, the world was very poor and life was very harsh. Now things have changed dramatically. Science has changed the picture. Does that same promise and that same vision hold good? This is true that science has transformed the life of man transformed the earth, the environment, and even the thoughts of mankind. In olden days this was not the state. People lived for a shorter period. The average span of age was much, much less. They were afflicted by pestilences, diseases, famine, drought, and other natural calamities. Their life was one ceaseless struggle from morning till night to make their two ends meet. In such conditions it is no wonder that Buddha calls life a bed of suffering, dukkha that the whole existence is dukkha, suffering, pain, sorrow, and one must find ways to go out of it. That is perhaps also the reason why he prescribed the monastic system. But now science has made life very alluring, very comfortable, very convenient, with so many attractions that one would like to live forever. But the necessity of, the, of religion remains the same. In those days, those who followed religion had the idea in their mind to escape from the pain and suffering of the world. During these days, those who now follow religion and are eager to have some kind of a religious experience, want to escape from the hard struggle and also even overabundance, which is perhaps one of the banes, the curses of modern life. So the need is still there and the urge in these circumstances as exist at present when we have all the comforts of life but still are not aware of our own identity is greater. With all that we have we do not know who we are and we will always live in the fear of death. This is considered to be the greatest fear of all, the fear of death. Young men do not experience it so much as the elderly people who are now about to cross the frontier, even their courage gives way as the other shore is dark and gloomy, we do not know what happens there. Religion is meant to bring a solace that life is eternal and therefore the need for religion is the same now as it was in olden times when life was harder and more uncomfortable. Do you think it will be possible to establish a unity of religious thought? It is not only possible, but that should be our aim, to establish the unity of religion is the most urgent need of our time. 
mankind cannot afford to live divided either politically or spiritually with the threat of a nuclear war hanging over our heads. Therefore, it is necessary that all the faiths of mankind should be united. That is also necessary to bring conviction to people, otherwise any well-informed man whom we ask to have faith in his own religion replies, now there are so many religions, why shouldn't I have faith in another? Why this one and why not that one? And why are religions different if they all proceed from God? Why have prophets given a sort of different teaching on certain issues? So this creates doubt and misgivings in the hearts of rational people. Therefore, the time has come when all religions should unite. And to achieve this unity, it is absolutely necessary that we should know the factors responsible for the religious experience. How could the prophets have the vision of God when others do not have it? Was it a special favour or is there something in our brain and in our body about which we have no knowledge at present? I have studied this question for the last about 40 years and myself have had some experiences which are very relevant to this issue. According to my own experience, there is a region in the human brain which is inactive and dormant in normal people. As is well known, we use only 10 percent of the capacity of our brain. The 90 percent of it is not utilized. There are zones and regions in it which are silent and which are not active in the normal human beings. It is the activation of one of these zones that creates the profit. Through this zone, we can receive vibrations from those levels of creation which are not perceptible to us through our senses. And scientific demonstration of that region and centre can unify all the religions at once, because then there will be no dispute that it was my prophet who was sent from God, or it was my prophet who is an incarnation of God. Then everybody will know that all these prophets had a special endowment like men and women of genius in their brains, through which they could perceive the glory of the Spirit, through which they could reach the hidden levels of creation to which we have no access. That would solve this problem once for all and unify the religions. Are there techniques to activate that center in the brain? Does yoga, for example, do that? Do asanas, body postures, or breathing exercises help? All religious disciplines are designed to activate the centre. In fact, religion is the channel through which the racial consciousness has worked to give a picture of the future state of man and the disciplines and the way of life he has to follow to reach that state. Even a cursory look 
at the scriptures will clear this point. Christ refers to the kingdom of God lying in us, which we can achieve by living a righteous life. Krishna refers to the vision of the cosmic form or the final state of yoga to which we can attain by following certain principles of life. Buddha refers to his eightfold path to achieve realization of oneself or nirvana. And Muhammad also refers to the straight path, Rahe Mustaqim, the straight path by which one could reach Allah or God. So you see, in all the religions of mankind, there is a target where man has to reach an ideal of God or Allah or Jehovah or Nirvana or Brahman, and also the way of life to be followed and the disciplines to be undertaken by which it can be attained. Yoga is also one of these disciplines. Meditation is also one of these disciplines. All these disciplines have been revealed by mystics, prophets and spiritual teachers under inspiration to guide other fellow human beings on the path, to show them the way which they themselves traversed to reach divinity. From this point of view, when we practice yoga or meditation or any other form of religious discipline, we are trying to accelerate our evolution. We are trying to activate the region in the brain in order to reach higher levels of perception. When we reach those higher levels of perception, then we can perceive or intuitively grasp the divinity behind this universe. So the purpose of meditation or yoga or any other spiritual discipline is to reach a transcendental state of awareness in which the hidden reality of the universe becomes perceptible to us. We, uh, we hear so much about meditation and there are so many ideas about it. What is meditation? Meditation is concentration. Meditation is the application of the mind on the divine. Normally we apply our mind to the solution of worldly problems. We apply it to study we apply it to get a degree, we apply it in our business, we apply it in our writings, we apply it in mathematics, astronomy, science, we apply concentration in all branches of knowledge. In fact, it is concentration and application of the mind that has given us all the knowledge we possessed. Even in olden times, people who were interested in astronomy would sit flat on the grass, gazing at the spy, uh, sky and concentrating their attention on it to know the movements of the stars. All knowledge is the result of uh, the application of our mind. When we apply the same mind on divinity, that is, on transcendental realities, on something which is not visible to us in the normal way, then we activate the centre already provided by nature for the purpose. By constant application, by constant concentration, by constant meditation on divinity, 
and transcendental realities, we are stimulating the center. And suddenly one day they can bear fruit and the center can be activated. The purpose of meditation is to activate this dormant center in the brain. There is no magic in it. It is wrong to say that when you meditate, you will reach God all of a sudden. You will take a leap. How? When everything we do, think or act comes from the brain, how can we take a sudden leap and reach God, leaving our brain halfway out? That has been a mistake throughout. On the other hand, the actual position is that all our religious disciplines are meant to accelerate our evolution. It is for this purpose that they were relieved to the prophets. In addition to the disciplines, we have also to follow a certain model in our life. And this model, too, has been described by the prophets. There they are all agreed. Humility, charity, self-discipline, frugality, austerity, love of fellow human beings, compassion, faith in God, devotion, and qualities of this kind are repeatedly mentioned everywhere. They are in the Sermon on the Mount, they are in the Ten Commandments, they are in the Quran, they are in the Bhagavad Gita, they are in Dhammapada and all other religious scriptures of the world. So two things are needed for accelerated evolution. One, modeling of the life according to certain ideals as prescribed in religion. And second, meditation or yoga, whatever you choose to call it. Meditation also includes worship and prayer, because these two are necessary to keep our heart always in tune with the infinite, a sense of adoration and a prayer inside to grant us the vision. These two combine together to help in our meditation, and then we can achieve success in our effort sooner than we could do if we were to have our meditation in a mechanical manner. There are many teachers who use mantras as a way of achieving a vision of God. Is, are mantras useful? Well. This question is often asked of, of me, but perhaps a little rational examination would uh, clear the confusion. Mantras means combination of certain words or sounds, and they are prescribed to be repeated by the disciple or by an aspirant a certain number of times. There are hundreds and thousands of mantras in India. Some mantras have meaning. For instance, Shivoam, I am Shiva, Gayatri mantra. And some mantras have no meaning. They are only a combination of sounds. Sound has an effect a vibratory effect on many things. Sometimes soldiers crossing a bridge by their rhythmic movement make the bridge tremble, mm. and sometimes avalanches come down from the mountains with certain sounds. But in the case of reaching God, I do not see the rationality in believing that mantra can lead us to him. For instance, can you tell me of an instance where a child grew up into an adult overnight by means of a mantra? 
can you give me an instant where a war was won by a mantra? Any instance where a man passed his PhD with a mantra without reading anything? It is just a idea, not a correct idea in the mind of the people, in the minds of the people. I will explain this a bit. There are two kinds of people who meditate, roughly speaking. One are those who have a very powerful imagination and can visualize. For them it is very easy to sit in meditation and visualize divinity as light or as consciousness or as God or as anything. But there are also people whose power of visualization is very poor. They admit it to me also. For them sounds are better. They can concentrate better on sounds. And if the mantra has a meaning, such as, I am Shiva, or that, O Son of Consciousness, grant me the vision, mantras of this kind. That means the concentration is now done on the sound and on the meaning of the mantra. Or, in other words, that person has something to concentrate on, but the actual thing needed is concentration and meditation not only the reputation of the mantra. So, we can meditate even without a mantra or with a mantra according to the constitution of different people. But a disciplined life, a moderate existence, avoidance of immoderation and excess, temperance, truth, honesty, compassion, submission to the Divine Will, surrender, they all are absolutely necessary for any success in the spiritual effort. No amount of mantras can help us if our life is not in accordance with the law. Sometimes it's written about yoga that miraculous gifts and psychic powers are to be gained after its practice over a period of years. Is there a truth in that? And if there is any truth, what would be the purpose of those powers? There is a great deal of misconception here also. Now let us say what powers, first of all. The Yoga Sutra of Patanjali refers to Siddhis, means miraculous powers, and they are said to be of eight kinds, to make oneself invisible, to make oneself very light and fly in the air, to make oneself very heavy, to know the thoughts of others, to be able to know the diseases and so on. Now the point is this, suppose a man spends all his life to gain the power of making his body light in order to fly. How does it help his soul? And during these times he pays a few dollars and can have a f flight wherever he likes. Why should he spend all his life in learning to fly? Buddha also condemned miraculous powers very strongly in his discourses. Almost all the prophets do. It is a waste of energy to do the same thing with spiritual powers that one can do with his intellect. We can cure diseases, we can find remedies for them, we can fly in the air, we can float on the water, we can dive into the sea, we can hear things from London, we can see the sceneries and the towns and everything by our television. Why should now all our life be spent in gaining these powers when we have them already at our disposal? 
some people have the idea that they can become invisible, go from one place to the other and do whatever they like. But if they had the patience to study the question in depth, they would find that there is no historical record of any such person. If in this age there were one person with the power to make himself invisible and to fly one from one place to another, this one single man could make a nation the sovereign of the earth. He could go every night into the room of a dictator or a prime minister or a scientist or a manufacturer and make them do what he liked, maybe with a revolver in his hand. Such one man would be equal to all the armies you have. You cannot resist him. But we see that so many massacres happened and there is such a dread of nuclear weapons now, and mankind lives in constant terror of a holocaust. But there is no one who undertakes to eliminate this threat. So this is more or less a myth. On the one side, nature has created a causal world, where she has given you the intellect to live by, to find your whereabouts, to discover the laws and forces of nature and to use them for your own benefit. Then all of a sudden she gives you another power by which all this is nullified. That is not in consonance with the law-bound nature, law-bound nature of the creation. So there is a misunderstanding. Meditation and the awakening of the spiritual centre do bestow certain intellectual gifts and also psychic powers like clairvoyance, clairaudience or prediction. But man is not the master of them. These powers are granted to him to the extent to which it is decreed, not a whit more. Man who has reached spiritual heights is no longer a normal individual with an ego or I. He is a vehicle of the Divine. In your own terms, is there an explanation for genius or for child prodigies, for example? You see, as I am saying, there is a dormant centre in the brain, which when fully awakened or active gives rise to illumination, makes one a prophet, a seer, an illuminated sage. But which one only partially active makes one a genius. And also, if active in another way makes one a psychic, but if active in a morbid way creates mental disorder. This is the biological explanation for all these four categories of mental phenomena, illumination, genius, psychic gifts and insanity. The basic cause is the same, activation of a dormant centre in the brain and the formation of a new psychic energy in the body. These two combine in the phenomenon of illumination, also in genius, in psychic gifts and in insanity. We are proposing uh, investigation of this phenomena and already we have established four research centres for them, three in India and one in Canada. We are also contemplating 
to have centers in the states as also in England. There is also one center in West Germany. Um, is there any reason to assume that mankind's evolution has stopped, or is there any evidence for a belief that the human brain is still undergoing a process of evolution? How can we hold the belief that human evolution has stopped? When we see new knowledge being gathered, new inventions being made, new discoveries being affected in every decade. On the other hand, the evolution has become much more rapid. It is so rapid now that it has become essential to prove it and to adjust whole humanity according to it. And this evolution is designed to activate this dormant center. In other words, evolution is carrying mankind towards a sublime state of consciousness, the same state which all the great prophets had in their visions. They are the forerunners of the man to come. The future species on the earth which will be born of us will not be the same as we are. They will have one added faculty in their brain, the faculty to know the invisible reality behind the universe and to come in contact with other layers of creation which are denied to us. So this evolution is proceeding every day. As you might have seen during the last two or three decades, there has been a great revival of religion, revival of interest in religion. People have taken to drugs, people are meditating in millions, people are attending church. Although the attitude of science has been sceptical and discouraging. Mm -hmm. But in spite of this, people are going more for religion now than they were going fifty years or sixty years before. The reason for this lies in the fact that it is the demand of evolution. It has created a great urge in the human heart to know itself. And therefore, every possible effort is being made to have experience of transcendence or higher consciousness. This is the reason why so many books are being written on the subject and why even so many uh, scientists are engaged on research of consciousness itself. So do you think that the process of evolution is being speeded up in the last few years? that evolution is accelerating in some way? Yes, there is a g rapid acceleration of evolution during these days. Science has provided all the facilities by which man can live a more leisurely and a more meditative life. Mankind in almost all parts of the world, I mean to say in those who have enough to eat and a shelter, they are constantly occupied with some sort of a mental discipline. They are reading, writing, seeing the television, hearing the radio, attending to work in their offices, which keeps their mind constantly occupied. That is evolution. The more you keep your mind concentrated, the more you stimulate your brain to evolve. In fact, it is concentration, as I, already, as I have already said, that has given us all knowledge. It is concentration that will give us higher consciousness also. And since our concentration has become greater, it means the speed of evolution has also increased. Do you think that there is a relationship 
between the body and the intellect that spiritual disciplines are meant to establish? Why don't we uh, just end it with that question? We're out of tape. We're going to be out of tape. Okay. Then we'll put new tape in. Okay. Then he should so have just a slight lunch. Then we can proceed. How much time have we been? About 53 minutes. Wow. How much? 53, 53 minutes. 55 minutes, basically. But we ran out of tape. We'll right, replace the, the tape. tape, so we'll pick up that last question. I see. And then you can have your lunch now. Yeah, yeah I will go for it. Yeah.